Okay, comrades, we're gonna get uh, started. Uh, do you wanna like grab a seat or this tables at the front? If comrades wanna grab them there, get a better view or turn around. Uh, I, I just introduce myself. I'm Ian Patterson. I'm the national chair uh, for uh, socialist students. Uh, so welcome everyone to the Social Students Conference. There's a free complimentary copy of uh, Claire Doyle's book, France 1968, Month of Revolution, about the uh, struggle uh, in France in uh, 1968. There's going to be a commission on that tomorrow, but it's a really uh, important uh, uh, moment in history for us to learn from, particularly uh, as members of socialist students uh, uh, as well. Uh, I'd like to uh, welcome everyone to the Social Students uh, National Conference. Uh, we're having this conference at a very uh, exciting time. Uh, on one hand, uh, attacks uh, intensifying on students, young people uh, and uh, workers. We're beginning to see the privatisation of the student loan uh, company. At the end of last year, uh, there was a massive uh, clampdown uh, uh, on the uh, democratic right of students uh, to protest. But it's not just when we're at university, it's harder and harder for students uh, and young people, even after they've uh, graduated, thousands and thousands of pounds worth of debt uh, to find any meaningful kind of work, any decent job for everything that you've uh, invested in. Now the capitalist class is talking about after seven years of economic crisis, after all those years of austerity, we're finally coming out of things, we'll finally uh, get uh, uh, into recovery. But for the vast majority of working class people, not just here in Britain, but around the world, we can see that is not the case. Those at the top are reclaiming uh, their uh, profits, while ordinary people uh, 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 like us are carrying on uh, 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 to, uh, struggling. Now, despite all those attacks, we can take inspiration, uh, including from what students have done uh, in the last uh, uh, year. Uh, as I said, with the uh, attack on the right to protest at the end of last term, you saw the, will the continued willingness of students to struggle with the cops off campus uh, protest, which is going to get talked about later on uh, in the rally. And just next week, uh, we're going to have uh, the demonst uh, there's a week of action called over the student loan privatisation and uh, social students is organising a day of action uh, next week uh, over uh, that. It's not since uh, the student movement of 2010 and the trebling of tuition fees we've seen such a uh, massive attack that is one that can coalesce all students nationally around the single issue that we can fight, uh, strike uh, and protest uh, either. But the thing about socialist students, what sets us apart from all the other uh, groups at the universities is we don't just think about what affects students, we uh, always bring our members, bring all these students uh, up to date with the struggles of ordinary working class people. We try and unite students and workers every uh, opportunity and right here in London our members have been along uh, supporting the University of London workers uh, organised in the International Workers of Great Britain Union who won uh, a victory uh, over, it's a mainly immigrant workforce, they won a victory uh, over uh, management that was refusing to give them the same conditions as the existing workforce. Just in that same union, uh, uh, workers at the Royal Opera House this week, uh, which many of our members won the demonstration for, won a victory winning uh, the living wage uh, for those uh, workers. Next week on the 6th of February, we're going to be going along, uh, as we have been, uh, to supporting higher education workers when they take strike action against attacks uh, on their pay. And it's not just what education workers and education unions are doing. Like I said, right here in London, we've got a hugely uh, important big battle uh, brewing up next week. Uh, the uh, RMT Rail Workers Union is going to take its first uh, uh, round of 48 hour strikes against uh, uh, the initial cuts of a thousand job losses uh, being made on the underground and undoubtedly our members will be going down to support that strike as well. But it's not just the campaigning that we can do, what gives socialist students strength is that we're a socialist organisation. We all uh, raise a socialist alternative uh, to, to uh, capitalist misery uh, and try and build a socialist force on the university and college campuses uh, uh, every step uh, of the way. And that uh, work, dual work that we've uh, been doing has helped uh, make social students uh, the biggest left group uh, on the university uh, uh, campuses. We're active in, on now more, on more than 50 uh, college and university campuses around the country, more than any other uh, left uh, group. Now tonight uh, we've got 
uh, the, tomorrow, sorry, uh, we've got the main social students national conference where we're going to be able to debate and discuss and vote on uh, the direction, the policies, the strategy uh, the, uh, for uh, socialist students uh, in the next uh, year. We thought it was important uh, tonight to have this rally for revolution uh, where we'll be able to hear from some of uh, st social students members but also uh, some of the big uh, struggles uh, that workers uh, are uh, in involved in. We've got uh, four uh, speakers uh, at the rally uh, here in Britain uh, tonight but firstly uh, uh, many, uh, I'm sure almost everyone here would have seen what's happening uh, across in the United uh, States because uh, you look across, uh, for a long time you can look across at the US and think that's a big country, 300 million people, you hear all the propaganda about uh, from coming out from uh, Fox News about free market uh, capitalism but in polls done in the last years uh, asking young people whether they preferred socialism to capitalism. A quarter said they preferred socialism, a quarter said they didn't know, and half of young people in the United States said they preferred socialism uh, to capitalism. And on the back of that, we saw the fantastic victory uh, of Sharma Sawant uh, in the Seattle City Council elections, winning 90, more than 90,000 votes, uh, more than any other, uh, more than any MP, uh, more than any support that any MP has here uh, in Britain, and we can take massive inspiration uh, from that. But a struggle for socialism, but also the concrete issues of their struggle uh, for the fight for 15, the fight for a 15 uh, dollar an hour uh, minimum wage, with our struggles uh, here uh, in Britain. Uh, firstly, we're going to play uh, a little video, give a bit of background about uh, Sharma's campaign. Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. As we turn now to Seattle, Washington, where a former Occupy Wall Street activist is being sworn in today to the city council. Kshama Savant is the first socialist elected to the city office in Seattle in generations. We have shown that it's possible to succeed as an independent, grassroots, openly socialist campaign not taking any money from big business, not currying favor with the establishment parties of big business, having an unapologetic campaign platform for improving the living standards of Seattle's working people and rejecting the business as usual. This, this moment belongs to that way of organizing. Shama Savant has also played a pivotal role in the Fight for 15 movement, the campaign to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour in the Seattle area. Voters in the nearby community of SeaTac recently increased the minimum wage for many local workers to $15. While that vote's being challenged in the court, Seattle's new mayor, Ed Murray, has just announced plans to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour for all city employees. We go now to Seattle, where we're joined by Shama Savant, newly elected socialist city council council member of the Seattle City Council, member of Socialist Alternative. She's also a teacher and a union activist. Welcome to Democracy Now! and congratulations, Kshama. Can you talk about what today means, today your inauguration? Thank you, Amy, for having me here. Today's inauguration really is an absolutely historic moment for working class politics and to understand to really feel the moment that this is a turning point in the history of the United States. And, and I don't mean just the election of a socialist and city council, but everything that you've been mentioning, the Occupy movement, the movement to legalize marijuana use, marriage equality, this is all an indication that the people in this country are extremely frustrated and angry and outraged at the status quo, at the deepening income inequality, poverty, the political dysfunction of the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. And, and there's this deep search for alternatives. And the fact that we have been victorious in this grassroots campaign is really an indication that people are ready to start moving forward, moving into struggle. And so the real, the real question is, how are we on the left, how are we going to uh, take up this responsibility of organizing the vast numbers of people, especially young people, for whom there is no future, and how are we going to present those alternatives?
Why did you decide to run as a socialist, Shama? The first thing is, uh, I'm a member of Socialist Alternative, which is a nationwide organization of social and economic justice activists. And that by itself presents a really uh, different way of organizing politics and political actions, where it is not simply up to me as some sort of superstar, but really a democratic decision among large numbers of people saying, you know, year after year, we are asked to vote for Democrats or Republicans, and nothing changes. Wall Street is making historically high profits since the recession broke out, and the burden of the recession has fallen squarely on the shoulders of ordinary working people. How do we come out of this? What is the way forward? And presenting a different type of electoral politics was extremely important to me and to everybody else who was involved in this campaign. And there were hundreds of people who worked on this campaign. And the important thing about running as a socialist is, you know, for one, to show that there is a definite openness for clear alternatives, not only to the big business parties, but the system that they represent, the capitalist system. And if you look at recent polls, they show that people, especially young people, are much more open to socialism than you would find out from the corporate media. People are also fed up with the political dysfunction. 60% of Americans recently said that they are looking for a political alternative to the Democrats and Republicans. And, you know, everybody says, well, don't you have to vote for Democrats because otherwise the evil Republicans will come in? And, of course, it's absolutely correct that, you know, Republicans and the right wing need to be, uh, you know, defeated. But at the same time, it is important to recognize that the reason the right wing, the Tea Party and the Republicans gain any sort of ascendancy over the American people is because the Democrats do not present an alternative. The Tea Party arose because of Obama's administration's failure to deal with uh, the, you know, the outrage against the bank bailouts, and the Tea Party channeled it. So really, it's up to us to present a different way of doing that, to really show that working people can fight for ourselves. It's not simply about electoral politics. The electoral arena is one avenue where we can, uh, you know, gain a hold, you know, occupy the space, so to say. But really, the question is, how are we going to organize overall? How are we going to have a mass movement that will challenge the status quo of capitalism? You were involved in the campaign uh, to have the minimum wage increase to $15 an hour. I want to play highlights from news coverage of a recent march by the Fight for 15 campaign in the Seattle area. After the yes vote in SeaTac, there's a lot of energy behind this cause. The cause for, you know, basic necessities for everyday things that you need. Sometimes you just don't have enough on the wages that we make now. I'm out here for everyone. I'm out here for me, my family, my children. I'm out here for our future, all future generations. $15 an hour would change her family's life. Well, be great. Pay bills off, medical bills, go back to school. I mean, I wouldn't have to work two jobs. Okay. That was coverage of uh, the whole campaign for the minimum wage to be increased to $15. You've been an integral part of that. Explain what's happened, both at SeaTac and Seattle. Yes, this uh, really started with, you know, the growing discontent against uh, economic inequality and the abysmal standard of living uh, and the race to the bottom that is being uh, meted out to the vast majority of people, especially the younger generation, low-wage workers. And uh, as you all have covered on Democracy Now!, December 5th of 2012 was a pivotal day when fast food workers walked out in New York City very courageously, might I say, uh, to take a stand on $15 an hour and the right to unionize without retaliation. And that movement for $15 an hour has really captured the imagination of people all around the country. And as you mentioned, the SeaTac initiative last year in 2013 went through, you know, people voted in a majority to uh, uh, give $15 an hour to all, uh, all the workers there, especially the airport workers. And in Seattle, we, our campaign, Socialist Alternatives campaign, has been campaigning for day one 
for $15 an hour for all workers in Seattle. We've also been campaigning for affordable housing and for taxing the wealthy to provide funding for transit and education. And now this battle has come full force to Seattle. You mentioned the mayor in, a, in the third day of his term talking about uh, $15 an hour for 600 uh, city employees. We're saying that this is a positive step forward, and it really reflects how much groundswell of support there has been. The movement has really been building up. And I would urge everybody to go to 15now.org, that is 15now.org. That's the website we have launched. It's a grassroots campaign that we are, are starting to mobilize in Seattle to fight for 15 in 2014, and I would urge all your viewers and listeners to go to the website, volunteer, sign up to help out, please give your financial contributions. It doesn't matter whether you are in Seattle or not. This is the epicenter of $15 an hour, and we need the support of everybody all around the country. And you know, I think it's important to see how dramatically different the political terrain here is today since before Occupy. Before Occupy, there was a lot of, uh, you know, disenchantment and, and a sort of a feeling of demoralization. Occupy ended the silence on inequality, and really it, it put capitalism at front and center. You know, the, the question of the fact that we need a system change. And what, uh, what's, what's happening in Seattle is, you know, in a sense is not unique in the sense that the social conditions that uh, are preparing people to jump into struggle are, exist everywhere in the country. What's different about Seattle is that the workers and labor activists in SeaTac went forward with this ballot initiative and Socialist Alternative and its supporters had the audacity to challenge the Democratic Party establishment and go forward with, with, with what is now a victorious uh, campaign for a socialist and city council. And that's an example, a seed for something that can be carried over. And so uh, I would urge everybody to support us. Uh, Kashama, very quickly, in your state, in Washington, the 30,000-member union of machinists has narrowly accepted a new contract from Boeing that includes major concessions on pensions, health care benefits, wage growth. Uh, can you talk about this? The union had rejected Boeing's previous offer by, like, two-thirds in November. Yes. And, in fact, people, uh, for people who have been following the news, you will know that Boeing workers, the workers in the state of Washington, have been extremely courageous, and we've been in solidarity with them in rejecting the really—this uh, uh, is, this is economic blackmail by the Boeing CEOs. And they have extracted tens of billions of dollars of subsidies from the state. And this is yet another example of why we need an alternative to the Democrats and Republicans. You know, the Democrats have colluded as much as the Republicans in the state legislature, totally sold out the Boeing workers and urging them to accept this really uh, this real assault on their living standards. Washington and approved the largest corporate tax break um, by a state to a single yes. corporation in U.S. history. That's quite astounding. Yes, Finally, but, what would you say, Kshama, yes. to uh, people who want to run on a third-party platform like you did as a socialist? I, I would say that it's, it is very possible. There is an openness. And in fact, I would go farther than that. I would say Look at our campaign. Look at Lorain County, Ohio, where 24 labor activists were elected on independent left labor ticket, not Democrats or Republicans. And most importantly, this would be an abdication of responsibility of us on the left if we did not challenge the two-party system. Shama Savant, we're going to have to leave it there. The I thank you so movement. much for being with us. The newly elected social city council member of Seattle City Council. She's being sworn in today. That does it for the broadcast. Happy birthday to Claudia Ibarra. Democracy Now! produced by Mike Berkner. I'm Amy Goodman. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global grassroots news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org today. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.
Okay, we'll carry on with the rest of the rally. Obviously, I'd really like <coughs> for, over here in Britain to thank Sharma for speaking, for, uh, for addressing the conference, for recording us uh, that uh, video. Uh, it's an absolute inspiration and shows that socialists can get elected anywhere and there's mass support for what the ideas that we're uh, uh, fighting for. We need to use that success in the US right here in Britain for the struggles that we're uh, involved in. That's why we've got our other uh, speakers uh, uh, tonight. Uh, I'll introduce them uh, as I bring them in uh, to speak. Uh, our first uh, speaker tonight is uh, uh, Megan uh, Olahead, who's a member of uh, York Uni uh, uh, Socialist uh, uh, students uh, and we uh, well, they can be able to explain herself but there's a lot of attacks happening on ordinary working class people at the moment there's a lot of austerity measures going through there's a lot of defeats but at York University over the housing campaign uh, we've won a victory and we need to shout our victories as loud as possible and show that we uh, can uh, win in fighting back against the uh, continent Can you hear me right at the back? Yeah. Because, okay. Yeah, so I'm here to talk about the student housing campaign, which I assure you is every bit as exciting as having a city councillor inaugurated in America. Um, I know it sounds slightly embarrassing following the Charles one, but um, okay, so yeah, the issue of housing in the student movement is, is live at the moment. Um, housing is one of the most absolutely basic human needs, along with food, water, warmth, sleep and having a roof over your head is obviously vital to ensure a happy and healthy quality of life. Yet when people talk about student housing, the common conceptions surrounding student housing are automatically, you know, they're images of horrible conditions of, of damp, of bad wiring, of massive rents, of grasping landlords and those things are all taken as being part of the course in many ways. They're character building or they're just all part of the student experiences and in many ways when we find housing with, you know, just about acceptable conditions very often they're painted as something for which we should be grateful and obviously we know that that is not good enough and students are not and should not be prepared to settle for that any longer and are not prepared to accept an all-out very exploitative assault on their most fundamental living conditions the disgusting price set on higher education today which is being raised higher and higher under this government and presumably any government after massively affects the living costs of students both on campus and off it all of the extra money that students are currently being forced to fork out for tuition fees, that's everyone younger than me, on £9,000. Um, while that allegedly goes into providing better services for students who are putting themselves into thousands and thousands of pounds worth of debt for the privilege, as you're acutely aware, I imagine, um, that extra money actually, in reality, tends to do no such thing. It sort of falls into, particularly at my own university, a sort of spiralling vortex of debt which is caused by the uni kind of speculating on its assets knowing that they were turned in essentially gambling on students' quality of life to further its own financial capital. Uh, for instance, the price of accommodation on my campus has risen on average by about 15 to 20 pounds every year, year on year, for about 10 years. So um, the cheapest accommodation anywhere on campus at the moment is 100 pounds per week. Yeah, um, the most expensive, by the way, is 150. Every, that's not, a student loan doesn't even cover that. And when I was a freshman, it was £75 a year for the cheapest. And that was, we're talking shared room with damp and, and wasps. You know, it was just <laughs> really horrible. Um, yeah. And this, it doesn't make the conditions better. For example, that damp and wasps accommodation I've already mentioned, they're looking at a plan to demolish that accommodation as opposed to refurbishing it and replacing it with a PFI scheme, which would undoubtedly hike the price of the rents up even more than what they already are. Um, private accommodation, like off campus accommodation, is no better. Um, it's in York, I know the way it functions certainly is a sort of bloated, very small cartel kind of uh, model. They consistently annually raise their prices together, which obviously in turn forces landlords to put their rents up, which leaves you know, students, vulnerable, economically precarious individuals, in a trap with you know, no choice but to pay a premium for buildings that are in some cases barely fit for human habitation. Uh, they're cramped, they're freezing cold. They're riddled with mould, um, I, my bedroom is riddled with mould. Uh, in some cases they're generally near fatal, uh, a study undertaken by the, my the university recently on its uh, recommended housing accommodation list found that 80% of the houses on that list, according to a sample, had problems that were considered serious or, and then 20% of those were, were potentially fatal, so that's wiring, that's, um, <laughs> yeah, that's heating problems, it's um, you know, structural damage, 
it's buildings that are likely to collapse on your head uh, without a moment's notice. Um, and the solution obviously to that is can never be just patching things up here and there individually, making complaints to landlords which sometimes don't get dealt with, or in some cases, uh, particularly one letting agent I can think of at York, are actively battled against. Uh, this landlord often threatens to sue student journalists who come asking questions about the way he deals with them. Um, things like deposits um, and his outrageous administration fees, for example, he charges students £60 every year to sign up with him again, even if they're not actually moving house. And these are obviously extra costs no student can realistically afford. So we, at, in the socialist group at York Uni, decided that it was time to change it. Um, so through just hard work, grassroots organisation and dedication and time of our members, we managed to push for and win a referendum calling for a not-for-profit, democratically run, union accountable student letting agency. Um, and to do this, we organised our demands in a very concrete, unarguable way, and by building student support through physically getting out there with petitions and materials, leaflets, briefings and so on, actually explaining our ideas to ordinary students. And through doing that, we managed to drag the student union around to our ideas despite repeated weak-willed protests about feasibility and we haven't got enough money because you know the sports teams are bitching that they haven't got a third swimming pool or whatever. So I would I would argue definitely from experience that student unions absolutely have the money for these vital services whether they want to give it up or not. And it's our job as an organisation which has the capacity to go out and campaign to fight and make tangible beneficial gains to make sure we hold the student union bureaucrats to account and push them into working for the interest of students' real material conditions. The referendum we fought for and won at York is real, short, if real proof that we can truly be a major campaigning force if we set about our demands in a way that is correct and intuitive towards the real needs of students on the ground. But this victory is important in the sense that it demonstrates a very definite desire among students to engage with the conditions in which they live and make an effort at changing them when they are inevitably not good enough. However, for all this victory is crucial in setting a precedent. Um, the student union at York University will be the first student union in the country to run a sustainable, not-for-profit letting agency model. Uh, we should be taking student housing nationwide and trying to bring it back into the hands of the state, not being run for profit with no cynical exploitation of human need for private gain. Obviously, we also believe that the issues of housing in this country are not merely confined to students. Uh, council house building has fallen by about 185% under the current government. Uh, the fear of the bedroom tax is literally causing suicides amongst the country's most vulnerable claimants. And the number of homeless people on British streets has risen by more than a third since 2010. We believe that all housing should be brought back into democratic government control, putting the quarter of a million approximately jobless construction workers back into work providing vital housing supply that we really do truly need and are seeing a lack of more than ever today. Because at the end of the day, we're not just student activists, we are socialists, and our work should reflect this by being at all times rooted in the working class everywhere. The student housing market can be influential in driving up or down um, residents' rent costs elsewhere, and any not-for-profit initiative could push landlords renting to residents you know, to potentially lower their prices so the residents don't look elsewhere. We must, as an organisation, strike the balance between focusing on campaigns which have the potential for real and solid victories and pushing our calls for better conditions wider into communities across the country. So this victory at York is by no means the end of our struggle there. It is, in fact, more of the beginning. It should empower us all and our campuses to take that, a cause like that and the spirit that goes with it onto our own campuses and work hard to present a strong socialist programme with the set of demands that, if we are prepared to fight for them, can definitely be won. And we should also be vigilant to ensure that we connect our work to the wider struggle. And through presenting our demands clearly and unashamedly as socialist ones, we put our ideas at the heart of everything we do and encourage other students and working people to come on board and join us in the struggle. Much, uh, uh, Megan. Uh, our next speaker uh, is uh, Hannah Sell uh, uh, from the, Social, the Deputy General Secretary uh, of the Social Party. Obviously, uh, the Social Party has given huge support and resources to help uh, social students. So, we really appreciate Hannah coming on to speak. Okay, thank you very much, Ian, and uh, thanks to socialist students for their for inviting me to speak at this important rally tonight. I would say actually the meeting you're having tomorrow, the National Conference of Socialist Students, where you can discuss and debate how you're going to develop socialist students, is 
even more important than the rally this evening, but nonetheless, uh, I'm very pleased to be uh, invited to speak. Um, last week, as many of you will have seen, the supposed thinkers of capitalism globally had their own conference in the Davos summit. And it was very interesting, the discussion that took place at it, but also in the press beforehand, where they said that one of the biggest threats to capitalism in the next period, in their view, is inequality, because it will lead to instability. Christine Lagarde from the IMF has said the same thing, about a fear of instability. Instability is a polite word for a fear for revolution and revolt. When you have a world which was revealed just as the Davos summit started, and most of you I'm sure have seen the statistic, where 85 people, a double-decker busload, have the same amount of wealth as the bottom half of the whole world's population, then the capitalist class are right to be worried that people will not keep putting up with that. And actually, they kind of can't believe their luck that they have not faced more revolts, more revolutions in the course of the capitalist crisis than they have done so far. But while they might feel that they're lucky, nonetheless, globally, 2013 was another year of revolt. Brazil, Turkey, Greece, again, has been a country in revolt every year for the last few years. 31 general strikes have taken place there now. And in all of those, young people in general, and students in particular, have played a very important role. It's true of the revolutions as well. The Egyptian revolution in particular, it was the urban youth, students, but more than students, recent graduates who couldn't get work, who were really the spark, if you like, that began the revolution that took, uh, the revolution that took place there. And here in Britain as well, it's ancient history now. Most of you were probably not students when it took place. But nonetheless, when this government first got elected, it was the students who were first into the field of battle, with the magnificent movement that took place in 2010, first the national NUS demonstration, and then the strike wave, which socialist students and the socialist party played a central role in initiating. Now the government, as we know, was able to force through the hike in fee rises, doing it with police batons and police brutality. Although, by the way, the recent Cops Off Campus movement, it does show the limits of how far they can go with police and state brutality at this stage. There's no question, if you look at what they've got, they want to bring water cannon onto the streets now because they're frightened of future movements against austerity, all the revelations on spying and everything. They are creating the apparatus of a police state in Britain and in other countries as well. But how far they can use that depends on the political balance of forces. And the Cops Off Campus movement, initially, there was vicious police brutality. But I was very struck, I was out the country when it started, but I went on the last big demonstration in London, big, it was a few thousand demonstration, and the police were very clearly under orders to leave the students alone. The cops were off campus. Even when the students kind of semi-spontaneously all marched down to outside the Mark Duggan inquiry, and some of them started leaping on the riot bands and trying to hit the riot bands, the riot bands turned around and drove slowly away because they were so obviously under orders not to arrest any students and so on. That comes from the government. And that is because the government was terrified that a new student movement could be ignited and so they decided that discretion was the better part of valour on that occasion, or on that occasion at least. But obviously, on a national basis, despite important movements like Pops Off Campus, like the housing campaign and other things, since the defeat of the tuition fees, then the student movement in Britain has been relatively quiet. And yet it's in that period that probably most of you have joined socialist students, and socialist students has become the biggest left organisation on campuses nationally. And that can seem like a contradiction, that you've had success at a time when there are not mass movements of students taking place. But actually, it's not a contradiction. In the aftermath of 2010, there is no question the big majority of students and young people who became students after that movement drew the conclusion 
We hate this government, but you can't defeat them. And therefore, it's better to concentrate on other things, to concentrate on our studies, on the struggle to exist, to work, on enjoying yourself, whatever, because they didn't see the possibility of successfully defeating the government. But there's a big difference between that and being content. Thinking you can't win doesn't mean that you're happy with your lot. And as I'm sure other speakers are going to say, the situation that young people face today, I won't give statistics, you all know, but it's a real driving down of living conditions. The combination of the tuition fees, the lack of decent work, and the lack of a future. The fact that you don't have the prospect of having what your parents have, of a decent job, or at least a long-term job, of a home of your own to live in, whether it's rented or bought, the fact that all of that has gone, that today only 17% of British people expect their children to be better off than them. Whereas in the past, the majority always thought that their children would do better than they had done. All of that is creating a gigantic discontent and anger amongst all young people in Britain, including those in the universities. And of course, now there's the myth of the economic recovery. It is a myth. There might be a tiny recovery, but the British economy is still 2% smaller than it was at the time the crisis began. But there is no recovery for the majority, even if the economy formally grows throughout this year. Wages are still over 5% lower than they were at the time the crisis began. It's only Greece, Portugal and the Netherlands that are on an equal in terms of how much wages have been pushed down. The rest of Europe is not in as bad a situation in terms of austerity and fall in living conditions as Britain, uh, 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 as Britain uh, is. And for young people, it's clear the prospect of getting a decent wage, a decent job, being able to buy a house is now a dream, something you might get if you win the lottery or X Factor or something else, but otherwise you won't. There was an opinion poll just before Christmas that asked people how they felt about politicians. And they asked them to answer with one word. 47% of people chose the word angry. And that does sum up the mood of the majority, and particularly the majority of young people in Britain. But being angry doesn't necessarily mean that you can see an effective way to fight back. And that is the case at the moment for young people in Britain. But a spark can change that very quickly. After all, that was true in Egypt, it was true in Greece, it was true in Spain before the general strikes. Until people can see a way to fight back, then it can seem to be calm on the surface. And then they see a possibility and a movement erupts. And even while there is calm on the surface, and a majority are getting their heads down and trying to educate themselves rather than struggling. There is a minority who have looked at the world of their experience of the last few years and are drawing conclusions as a result of that. And that's why socialist students has grown. It's that minority of young people who have not thought there's nothing we can do, but have thought, well, we lost last time. Let's work out how we can make sure that we win, uh, that we win in the future. And are drawing all kinds of conclusions about what is necessary to change society. It's not a coincidence that you've got protests by economic students demanding that Marx and Keynes are brought back onto their courses because the economic gods that they're still being taught thought that capitalism would never have another crisis. People are looking at the system we live under and thinking, this doesn't work. There's a famous quote from Karl Marx where he says, he sums up capitalism by saying it is an accumulation of wealth at one pole at the same time as an accumulation of misery, agony of toil, slavery, ignorance, brutality and <coughs> mental degradation at the opposite pole. Now that is famous because throughout most of the second half of the 20th century, so-called Marxists said he was wrong about that. That's not true. The bottom half are getting better. You just can't argue that. Today, there was a feature on Marx in Time magazine, no socialist journal, which said that this showed how Marx understood the reality of 21st century capitalism, because of course, misery, degradation, our living conditions being put down, is what the majority are, uh, are, are suffering. And so there's a big layer of young people, not just in the US, but in Britain as well, who are looking for an alternative, and are open to socialist ideas. The question, of course, 
is how you change the world. Is socialism possible and how do you get it? And socialist students is very important, not only because it organises struggle on campus, which has already been very well described, but also because it's a forum to discuss those ideas. It's true, the Socialist Party works hard to build socialist students and to convince members of socialist students of our ideas about how to change the world. But socialist students is open to anybody who wants to change the world and is considering socialism and you don't have to be convinced of all of our answers to that. We're happy to discuss and to debate those ideas and I hope that you will do that tomorrow. Of course, I'm speaking from the Socialist Party, so in the last bit of my time I am just going to say a little bit on our views about how it's possible to change the world. The first thing I want to say is we are not powerless and we don't have to accept the planet like it is. Because all of you have been born and grown up in a period of history after the collapse of the regimes that existed in the Soviet Union and Eastern Europe. In our view, they were not genuine socialism. They were horrific dictatorships, a distortion of socialism, a terrible distortion. But after their collapse, there's been this idea there's nothing you can do. Capitalism is the only way to run the world. And if you dare to try and change it, it's bound to go wrong. Your leaders will betray you. It'll all end in disaster. So just accept your lot. There's nothing you can do about it. We do not accept that idea. Capitalism has not always existed, and it is a system that can be brought to, the, brought to an end. But it has created enormous technology which could be harnessed to provide a decent life for everybody on a much higher level than anything that has existed on the planet so far. I just want to give a seemingly secondary example. The British car industry has virtually disappeared in the sense there's no British car manufacturers anymore. But in the next year, the number of cars produced in Britain by foreign manufacturers, it's true, is due to reach its highest level ever. It's going to surpass the previous peak in 1972. You might think, so what? But the point of that is, there is less than a tenth of the number of workers producing those cars today than were producing them in 1972. Now, under capitalism, that means a lot of people have been chucked on the dole, a lot of people having to do muck jobs rather than working in the car industry and so on, and those that do work, working incredibly long hours, being forced to work till they're 68 before they retire and so on. But potentially, that productivity could be used to ensure that we could retire at 50. We could work a 30-hour week. People would have a decent life using the technology created by capitalism in order to meet the needs of all. Of course, we wouldn't need so many cars. We'd also change some of it to alternative means of production. And that's the second thing I want to say. We've got no choice but to fight to overthrow capitalism. I don't know how many of you saw the survey in The Guardian, again, just before Christmas, where it pointed out that there are 90 multinational companies that are responsible for two-thirds of global warming. So all the individual measures that we take to try and save the planet, they're not going to save the planet. Not as long as those multinational companies continue to wreck our environment. It's only by taking them into democratic public ownership and organising a socialist plan of production that we will be able to stop the, uh, uh, the, the destruction of our environment. Now, on how you change the world, I'm not going to have much time on this. How long was that? Ten. Ten, not ten. So I'll be quick on this. But I just want to say, young people are naturally impatient. And when you're suffering this austerity, you'd have to be mad not to be impatient. Because you want somebody to do something about it. But we have to be patient as socialists and revolutionaries. Because the idea that you can change the world with a small minority is tempting, but it's a mistake. What I mean by that is that ends in the ideas of terrorism, of shock, you know, 200 of us, we can storm parliament and we can get rid of these condemns, we can plant bombs to wake people up. All of those ideas are profoundly mistaken, although they are likely to develop, even in a country like Britain, if there is not a mass movement that is successful in fighting back against austerity. But in our view, yes, we should be impatient, but we have to struggle to move the majority. And in particular, as other speakers have said, we have to link up as students with the organised working class who have enormous potential power to change the world. There are six and a half million workers in trade union and trade unions in Britain at the moment. That is a very powerful force, potentially. If, as the 
union leaders promised. They'd gone ahead and called a 24-hour general strike, or they promised to consider it, rather. Then 82% of the population in Britain say they would have supported that general strike, and you would have had millions more flooding into the trade unions. But even without that, the strike action that is taking place shows the potential strength of the working class. The tube strike has been mentioned. The tube workers in London are a relatively small group of workers, but they have the power to bring the capital city, Canary Wharf, all of it to a halt if they go out on strike. And that's why Boris Johnson is determined to defeat them, and it's very important that we organise solidarity with that strike action. If workers had come out on strike together with the students in 2010, then the tuition fees would have been stopped at that stage, but also, actually, the condemns could have been forced out of power long before then. That that didn't happen was not as a result of the unwillingness of workers. The following year, in the huge demonstration and the big public sector strike, it was shown that working class people are willing to strike and to demonstrate against austerity. But, of course, the problem is trade union leaders who come from a previous era, who believe that concession bargaining, compromise with the capitalists, being reasonable is the way that you are going to win and are terrified of organising serious action against austerity. There is a comparison, if you go back in Britain, to the period before the 1926 general strike, when Lloyd George, then the Prime Minister, sat the trade union leaders down, said you can go on strike and you can win but then you will be the most powerful force in this country and state power will be in your hands. And the trade union leader said, we knew then and there we were defeated. Because the idea that they could leave the working class to take power was so terrifying to them that they immediately, at that stage, tried to retreat. It didn't prevent the 26th general strike as workers moved from below and forced them to take that action. But of course it did lead to how far the trade union leaders took it. The union leaders will only call coordinated strike action when they're forced to from below. But every indication, the firefighters campaigning to get their national executive to change its mind and to go on strike again after they retreated from the strikes. The teachers campaigning for their union leaders to call a national strike and now they've been forced to call a national strike under that pressure. The members are pushing from below for more serious action against austerity and we have to work together with those workers to build a joint movement. My very last point on the question of politics, and many of you were probably at the Tusk conference today, and there we were having a discussion about the change in the Labour Party structure and the fact that the trade, union, uh, trade unions are effectively no longer going to have any collective voice within the Labour Party. For some trade unionists, that would be a breaking point. For most young people, they'd be thinking, so what? Because already, they don't see any difference between the three major parties in Britain today. Although I would say that there can still be a layer of students who go and vote Labour in the next general election, not because they think they're good, but because they're desperate to get rid of the contents. But they can do that. But what they will then experience if we get a Labour government will absolutely clearly be a continuation of austerity and any brief hopes they did have will be shattered. But actually, the majority of young people, their attitude at the moment is to stand aside from politics. A plague on all your houses. You're all the same. You're all corrupt. We're angry with a lot of you. And we understand that. We're angry with a lot of them as well. But the trouble is, if you stand aside and take no part, you leave those people in power. We have to build a movement that is capable of challenging them. And that is on the streets. It's via strikes. It's building a movement, a party. But it is also standing in elections. In Spain, the Indignados movement, which swept through Spain before the last general election, didn't take any part in politics because they said it's corrupt. The result was they got an equivalent of a Tory party government because they didn't take part. And many young Spaniards have learned the lessons of that. Paul Mason, who I rarely agree with, described the situation in Egypt today as a revenge of the hierarchy. And what he meant by that is that the young people and workers who led the revolution didn't have their own party and therefore all of these other ultimately reactionary forces have been able to step, uh, step into the void and now we've got the military attempting to reconsolidate power. We need to be organised. We need our own party. Does that mean it's a party like the party of the capitalists? Absolutely not. We're building something completely different. But we do not accept the idea that by standing for election you automatically become corrupt. Far from it. Look at our record, look at Sharman taking a word.
workers' wage. Joe Higgins in Ireland, on the front page of the equivalent of the Sun, they had a full page headline, The Red That Money Can't Buy. Our Dave Nellist, who chaired the Tusk conference today, was described just recently when the MPs' pay got put up as many MPs rushed to condemn proposals to give them an 11% pay rise. Few have taken the lead of the former member for Coventry South. From his election in 1983 to his deselection in 92, he took less than half his salary, along with two other Labour politicians, also both supporters of ours at that point in time. We've got a proud record of electing fighters who keep live in the same conditions as the people they represent, but also fight for a programme that is in their interest. And that's the movement we're trying to build today. Socialist students, an important part of your work, in our view, should be also supporting the Trade Unionist and Socialist Coalition, which is planning to stand 625 candidates, if we can, in the elections in May. We're not expecting fireworks on quite the scale of Sharma just yet. Sharma was standing against one Democrat, unfortunately in most seats will also be standing against Tories as well as Labour politicians and so on, which can lead to people think they've got no choice to vote Labour. All of those problems exist, but we can make a splash. It can be, it will be, if we do our work, the biggest electoral challenge since the Second World War. Now you might think that makes no difference to students, but it's not true. Think about the US, the young workers fighting for the $15 an hour. It's not that having one member of the Seattle Council is going to win that, but having one member of the Seattle Council who's on the TV, who's in the council chamber, arguing their case, supporting their struggle, can give them enormous confidence to carry on that battle, and our elected representatives will do the same. So we'd appeal to any of you who are not in the Socialist Party, join us in that struggle on every aspect of our work, but above all, join us in convincing young people that we need to change the world, we need a socialist society, and that that requires ultimately building a mass revolutionary party organised on a socialist platform. <laughs> Thanks very much, Anna. I'll just introduce our, our penultimate uh, speaker, uh, Jamie Davis from the Youth Fight for Jobs campaign. Uh, at Socialist's last conference, we voted to support uh, the Youth Fight for Jobs campaign, which in the last year has done really uh, important work with the underemployment, are you sick of your boss initiative. And now Youth Fight for Jobs uh, is working uh, with the uh, Bakers Union, who won a victory against zero hour contracts, beating zero hour contracts at the Hovis Bakery in Wigan. They're now uh, launching a new campaign which we're, uh, 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 which Youth Fight for Jobs is participating in fast food rights to organise workers in the fast food industry, the super exploited workers taking inspira inspiration from the struggles like Sharma has spoken about uh, in the U uh, US. Jamie's a fast food worker, I would say which fast food chain he works for, but I'll introduce Jamie to talk about uh, uh, thank you, uh, Ian, and thanks, comrades, for having me uh, speak at the, the rally tonight. Um, as Ian introduced me, I'm, I'm a fast food worker uh, myself, and some students may think, uh, although I think it's been pretty much covered by the speakers already, um, what has uh, the struggle that young fast food workers face, what has that got to do with students? And, and I think there's two very practical answers. I mean, obviously, some students um, will be in employment, and some could be in, in this, uh, this sector. Um, but also think about all the students that are going to, uh, including yourselves, are going to be graduating, um, looking for a job in your profession, which, because of the state of the economy and, and, and the austerity policies being pushed through at every level by the government and by the bosses, um, the likelihood of you getting a job in your chosen profession is, is very slim, really. Um, and I found a, a sort of meme on, um, on Facebook, written from the uh, perspective of a student, which I think um, sums up uh, that and sort of the attitude of the government towards students. And it said, you used to tell me to go to university so I wouldn't have to go and get a job at McDonald's. Now when I protest that I have to work at McDonald's and not in my chosen profession, you call me a snob. And I think that really sort of sums up the position students are in right now, paying £9,000 tuition fees with uh, a, a very little chance of, of getting a job in, in what they want to qualify in. Um, as well as working in, in fast food, I also, I'm also a worker in a supermarket. Um, 
Now, I know it's, it's hard enough for some people to get, to get one job, and I'm, I'm very lucky I have two. Well, I'm sort of lucky. I mean, I'd rather have one, but the full-time contracts, uh, the bosses just aren't willing to take on full-time workers at the moment, so in order to get by, I've had to get uh, two jobs. Um, and the supermarket I work in is, is by no means a, uh, a worker's haven, um, really. <laughs> But to, um, I think, to highlight some of the conditions that the non-unionized fast food workers have to, to, to cope with, I'm going to draw out some differences, really, from the two workplaces because the supermarket is unionized. Um, first issue, guarantee of shifts. Now, I only get six hours a, a week, uh, 16 hours a week in the supermarket, but at least I know I'm going to get that every week, and I'm going to get paid at the end of the month. I haven't had a shift in the place uh, I work in fast food for three weeks, even though my contract says four hours minimum a week. And I've been to management. Uh, one of the managers was quite aggressive, actually, and, um, and told me um, that the reason they can get away with doing this is because of small print in the contract which says that hours are uh, adjusted to business needs. And so what it is, is it's almost a zero hours contract. It's not quite a zero hour contract, because they do have to give you the hours, it's just up to them when they give you the hours. As long as they give you the equivalent of the hours you work in the space of, I think it's either a quarter, three months, or a year, they could give you a, sh a four hour shift every day, and then that is supposed to make up for all those weeks that you didn't uh, have a shift. So it, it's not that different from zero hours, when you think about it, because people on zero hour contracts, they can't move out, uh, out of their house and, and, and start to make their own living um, because they don't know what money's coming through the door from one week to the next. To the point where I've had to um, resort to going into the, the restaurant and putting holiday forms through in order to get paid on the Friday. Wasting my holidays just so I get paid. It's an uh, absolute atrocity. So that's one. Um, one difference between the unionized and a non-unionized company, wages. Now, the wages in the supermarket aren't that great, but at least we get some sort of a pay rise every year, even if it's only 2%. It's still way below inflation, and it's not acceptable. Um, with uh, the fast food restaurant, um, you're not guaranteed a pay rise every year. If you've worked there for a certain amount of years and they're happy with you, they might call you in and offer an individual um, a pay rise. I mean that is, if nothing else, that's just a, a divide and rule tactic to, to get different workers on different pay schemes so that it's harder to organise any sort of protest against the conditions you're facing in the workplace. And of course, if, if, you, don't, um, if you don't get a pay rise, if you don't get a living wage, then it, it makes living a lot harder. Um, bullying and harassment. Now I'm not saying that there's no bullying and harassment in the, the supermarket, but at least you've got a union, at least you've got shop stewards you can go to and you can appeal to and you can ask them uh, to do something about it, to, to represent you if need be. Um, in in uh, the fast food ref, uh, restaurant, it's, it's almost encouraged by management in, in a way. It's not openly encouraged and there have been incidents lately where they've launched investigations into it, but a lot of the managers will do things like um, it's disgusting, it, you know, make comments to, to female workers, a lot of them very young and experienced female workers as well. Um, they will sort of just uh, give them hugs, unwanted hugs, things like that. And um, it's, so, it's almost encouraged um, in front of, of, of the male workers and that's another divide and rule tactic used um, in, in the workplace. Now, the benefits of unionization from those examples I think are pretty clear. Um, and all the while, while that's going on, the companies like the ones I work for, they're raking in millions of pounds in profits a year and they can't even afford to give us a living wage in, in, in their, uh, is their excuse. Uh, the, the recession is on and they can't afford it. Well, I, I don't think we accept that, to be honest with you. Um, and, um, I mean, while young workers like myself uh, we're punished with a 40% tax rate on our second job. So the wage I earn off the supermarket is tax rate is 40%. Meanwhile, 
I'm not getting hours from my first job. So it's in a situation where you really can't win. And the rich and the big corporations, they, ex they evade and they avoid tax every year to the tune of 700, no, 750 billion, isn't it? 120. 120 billion, sorry. <laughs> 750 is something. Uh, That's what they, I think they just got the banks. Yeah, oh, in the banks. But they avoid that, 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 that massive sum of money for evading, avoiding tax, exploiting tax loopholes, and exploiting tax havens, while young workers um, who need two jobs to survive uh, are paying 40% uh, tax on, on, on one of their part time jobs. Um, but, you know, it's all right to say that we, we, want, we want to unionise uh, workplaces, but we need fighting unions, you know, to defend the gains that our parents and our grandparents. Um, one uh, through struggle since the Second World War, um, to fight for, for higher pay, for a living wage, to stop workfare, zero contracts in their, in their tracks. We don't want casual labour, we don't want to be back in the situation of the 1930s where people are queuing up outside workplaces, uh, hoping that the boss is going to pick them to work today. And that's what's going to happen if we allow zero hour contracts to go through. Um, same with workfare. Um, you know, we want secure, full-time contracts where you know what you're getting every week, what you're working and what you're taking home, and you can start to, to build a life for yourself. We want a living wage, as I've said. We want to be represented by a fighting, campaigning union with the policy of nationalisation and democratic workers control at its very core. Comrades, what I've sort of outlined there might be a bit sort of gloomy, really, to think about it, a bit, a bit depressing. But I mean, as has been said by Sharma and the other speakers tonight, um, the Amer America is showing us the way at the moment. Um, it's already been touched on the fast food forward uh, uh, movement in, in America, where uh, non unionized fast food workers across, uh, well, it started in one, in one city, started to take wildcat strike action over the demands of a $15 an hour living wage and the right to unionise. And then those, those strikes spread to a number of other cities. And our comrades in America, um, in, in the campaign in, in Seattle, managed to tap, successfully tap into those demands. And it's become a, a real campaign now in America for $15 an, uh, an hour. And we, we as a socialists, we're internationalists, you know. We, we have an international perspective of the world and of the movement. And as an, a small example of how of events in, in other countries can have a knock-on effect and, and influence workers around the world, uh, Ian mentioned it in the introduction, the, the Baker's Union um, in, in the United Kingdom, who joined the uh, affiliate to the National Shop Stewards Network uh, last year, and um, as Ian said, uh, were, were able to defeat zero contracts at uh, Hovis. Um, they were inspired by what was happening in America. It's quite clear that they've been inspired by that. And now they're out looking to work with uh, organisations like Youth Fight for Jobs um, in trying to unionise um, workplaces and to, uh, 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 to fight for you know, good conditions for young workers. Um, and I spoke earlier of how... Um, so Youth Fight for Jobs, by the way, are going to be making contact on a national and a local level. Uh, to try to, to work with them uh, in their initiative. Um, I spoke earlier about hit our issues uh, for young workers uh, affect students. It is absolutely, as Hannah said, imperative that workers and students stand united if we are to bring down this rotten government. That's why we support the UCU taking strike action to defend our education and their own jobs. That's why we support the RMT when they take strike action. That's why we support trade unions, uh, workers taking industrial action to defend the gains made and to uh, defend their working conditions. Um, early today we heard reports from uh, the Trade Union and Socialist Coalition Conference and how comrades are building an alternative to austerity, the austerity parties across the country. Socialist students, as Hannah said, have a role to play in building Tusk as well. Um, comrades, we are, uh, we are a revolutionary organisation. Ultimately, the power to change society depends on the might of the organised working class. But let's get out there. Let's, um, 
You know, let's get out, let's build socialist students and you fight for jobs as organs that can contribute to the change in uh, society. The world is ripe for the ideas of socialism. So I'll that. Thanks uh, very much, uh, uh, Jamie. Uh, our final, uh, as has been said uh, earlier in tonight's uh, rally, uh, the cops off campus uh, protests were hugely important at the end of last year, showed uh, that students are still willing uh, to struggle. Socialist students around the country, but particularly in London, uh, where the protests were biggest, 3,000 uh, on, the, on the biggest one. Socialist students was at the forefront uh, of those uh, uh, demonstrations. So I'll introduce Helen Patterson, the London organiser for social students, uh, to talk about uh, those campaigns and what's going to happen next. Yeah, um, last term when we got the message that 50 students were going to go into occupation um, at Senate House against the closure of ULU, against the closure of the uh, Colleges of London Student Union, um, against other cuts and attacks that were coming from management, against the continued payment of poverty wages to support staff uh, at the Central London uh, Universities, we never expected that those 50 students on leaving the occupation uh, would be hit by police with batons. One student had teeth knocked out, that students would be violently ripped downstairs, thrown on the floor, and that uh, a number of arrests would have taken place. But from those 50, 100 students campaigning, um, the movement culminated, has been mentioned uh, at the end of last term, to 3,000 students marching through London. One of the biggest student demos that we've seen uh, since, since the sellout of the student movement in 2010 by the politicians that we had little faith in anyway but did promise not to treble our fees, but also the sellout from our own leadership, the sellout from the NUS who refused to carry on organising the uh, movement and leading the movement that was developing. But the problem is, the thing is now, a new layer of students who were probably in college, uh, if anything, uh, during um, the 2010 movement, are now studying in universities. They're paying the 9,000 p's, 9,000 p's, 9,000 pound fees. <laughs> They're having their services sold off. They have overworked and undervalued lecturers. They pay for expensive halls and have little support, seen as the support staff are being fired and being made redundant. And this is why Cops Off Campus was able to snowball into the movement they came, because pro students who hadn't protested before saw someone taking action against the attacks that they were facing, and they saw police being used to violently uh, repress student uh, organisations and wanted to be involved. But the thing is, imagine if when that demonstration was called, the NUS had said, we'll put on coaches, will help to build, will get people down for a national demonstration. Imagine if they had listened when we put pressure on them and said, call a national demonstration now. Or imagine if they had helped to build the local demos that happened against cops off campus. It would have been completely different and we could have been in the middle of a much bigger movement being whipped up around the attacks on campuses. And what cops off campus shows is that students aren't apathetic like we're told by the politicians, by the media, and by our own leadership. But we are still ready to fight for our education, for safe campuses, for our right to go out to organise and protest. Cops Off Campus is just a flavour of the movements to come. But the other thing that we have to think about with that campaign and why it was so explosive is because why are suddenly police allowed onto our campuses why are universities obsessed with attacking small, sometimes, protests that are taking on um, the attacks that are happening? Why are the police allowed to remove students violently from occupations? And why are universities spending hundreds of thousands of pounds on fast-track injunctions that allow security and police onto campuses to rip students out of occupations? Why are management allowed to suspend students 
for peacefully protesting against maybe vice chancellors' pay being trebled, against tuition fees, and against the attacks on our staff and their pay freezes. It is because our education is being privatised right to the core. It is being sold off to private profiteers. Our education system is a money-making venture. And that is the real fight that we have ahead of us, saving it from those profiteers and making it an education system that is one that we can organise in, but one that provides decent, affordable, free education for young people. Cops Off Campus started by mainly the activists, the people who are involved in their different campaigns, be it about the sell-off of student loans, about housing, we also campaign on that topic, house prices in London. It was the activists coming together and saying we also have to have an environment where we can organise and fight. But it's because, and that is the real fight that we need to carry on, if we really want to get cops off our campus, we need to end privatisation of our education. We need to fight for our leadership to take their jobs seriously, kick the profiteers and the careerists out of the NUS. We need to rebuild the anti-austerity movements that we saw a few years ago against tuition fees and the cuts, build socialist students groups as a resistance against those cuts and attacks, but also against the police coming on campus, against fees and austerity. We need to fight to defend the Birmingham 14 students who were arrested uh, at the protest on Wednesday. Protest as vigorously to end the suspension of the two Birmingham students as vigorously as we defended the Sussex Five who were themselves uh, 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 benefited from, from the movement that came up around them. And we need um, and we need to defend the students that were held for 24 hours peacefully protesting uh, through uh, Birmingham streets. They were told that they were the violent ones and are probably going to be charged with um, um, uh, uh, violent charges against uh, the police. But again, there's videos going viral on the internet of students being attacked on their floor, be on the floor being hit by police. But we're told that we're the violent ones. It's time for us to kick cops off campus, but it's also time to kick out the profiteers and really save our education system. And that is the goals of socialist students, and that is why it's so important that we leave the conference after this weekend, go back to our campuses, build the campaigns, fight for cops off campus, and for a really truly a, a non privatised state education system, free without fees. Thank you.